an official and very well warm welcome to everyone today. It's the last day of our Creative Industries Festival this year, but we actually have three very exciting events happening. And the first one this morning is immersive technology and community engagement. Today and this morning, we will be discussing what is the impact of immersive technology on communities? How might the potential of immersive work be leveraged for social engagement? In what ways can we make immersive work accessible? And how does consuming immersive media create the conditions for post-spectatorship? I'm very happy to announce that we have three presenters joining us today. One is, the first one is Debbie Bandara, Artistic Director of Forest Tribe Theatre, who will address the importance of deploying digital technology into real-time platforms for diverse and inclusive audiences. Then we have our very own Danai McKelly, who is Senior Lecturer in Digital Media Production at Oxford Brookes University. She will raise the ethical and creative challenges of producing a 360 degree documentary, capturing the artistic practices of an underrepresented community. And last but not least, we have Tobias G. Palmer from Theatre, Film, Television, Creative Practice at University of York, who will approach the notion of post-spectatorship and how interactive technologies have transformed our identities as spectators, and how these behaviours also have effects in the construction of our communities as immersive technologies start to permeate more and more into everyday life. So, hello. Um, let me just quickly introduce myself. So, my name is Debbie Bandara, and I am the CEO of Forest Tribe. I'm a choreographer, um, director and writer. And before we begin, um, I just want you to explain the piece that I'm going to share with you, which is a trailer. Um, it was um, designed and crafted um, in support with Digital Catapult. And really the, the trailer is called New World. It was an immersive theater show that was delivered to our audiences which have additional needs. So let me just explain that in a little bit more detail. The audiences were non verbal autistic young people um, with global development delay um, who are currently shielding and are still shielding right now. Um, so we were able to deliver this particular piece directly to them remotely using digital technology, which I'll explain in a bit. So that's just a bit of background information. I will now share my screen so you get to see the trailer. My world is your world. Treat it with care. Feel the earth beneath your feet. See its beauty. Listen. The rainforest whispers. It will show us a new world. Um, the, so the show itself was 
designed and created from a feminine lens. So it was really important to have the narrative and the structures where you were able to feel, smell, taste the Amazonian rainforest. It was really important to bring those elements to life. So the aesthetics of soft textures, of sumptuous movements, um, I really wanted the audience to be enveloped in, the, in all of the senses so that they all find the connection to our planet. That was the narrative. And that was the narrative to bring to our audiences who were currently shielding and who are shielding to bring them the sense of the, the beauty of the Amazonian rainforest and to understand the importance of it. So that was really important to the artistic vision, which is the core of the work that whatever we do as Forest Tribe, it's an artistic vision of how we create our stories. Um, I wanted to take our audiences and in a kind of a nomadic journey where they find their own inner wildness, where they, they are connected to the planet and to, to, our, to our earth and to find the fire that ignites them um, and then in, then in turn ignites others. So it's a real kind of important part of immersive theatre repertoire is to create all of those senses that are articulated in such a form that they create something bigger than its actual uh, quantities. So the other element really of the artistic vision is also the audiences that we serve. So that is so important to the core of our work to have a really inclusive design approach. We spend a lot of our time working co-creating, co-designing, going into our special schools and our communities that we serve so that we listen to their needs. So by being proactive and being on the ground, we're able to really understand what really works for them and generate the best high quality immersive experiences for them. And that's important. It's not just the children, but it's also the teachers, the parents, our stakeholders, our partners, everybody's involved in a really collaborative spirit. Um, so really the piece um, was the notion of being present and feeling a, a sense of connection to have the sense of collective consciousness is really important to our work. And that allows us to really focus on providing moments of stillness especially for the audiences that we work with, to provide that space and that time for them to consolidate and take in the world that we were giving to them. So that really is how we go on, on a journey. We take you on that journey through using immersive experiences, using digital technology, which I'll talk about later on. So the... Kamara was the main character that you saw. He was an uncontacted tribe member. And the idea was that he was remotely delivered from our studio using 5G connectivity. That meant that we were able to deliver real-time interaction to the children in our venues, in our special schools and theatres and libraries. That was really important part to provide that liveness, that human connection that we also wish to have when we're involved in the creative industries. So Kamara, actually, my, my vision was to bring in a live musical singer. So we, we were able to have him on the project. So he's an actual um, singer songwriter with his own record label. He's now touring at the moment, Jean-Michel. To be able to bring artists to come in live to deliver to audiences that are not able to access arts and culture is such a wonderful thing to offer. So he was able to talk directly to them, call them by their names and to see their faces light up, um, to know that they're actually having that live connection with, with, a, with, with a musical artist was amazing. And I think there's so much potential by creating immersive theater and immersive repertoire in, in, in collaboration with the music industry. So the narrative, as we're moving into the actual narrative format, there are layers, there are layers in the piece. Um, and it was really important that we had a live actor in the actual venue. 
through this, we were able to create gesture based choreographic movement, which is the communication that doesn't hold, that is open to, to interpretation, that allows the children the freedom to access and interpret the, the narrative in their own way. So much so that they were able to actually articulate some of the movements, which were hand gestures, movements of breath, which they now actually embed into their curriculum in the school. So it has that sort of longevity effect, that legacy where we're taking our work, not just in that immersive world for, for that moment in time, but it's actually been impermeating into their, into their life, into their daily routines, which is a wonderful thing to, to be able to share. So really, when we're coming to the digital technology elements, they're all custom built, they're all designed, they were not add-ons they're all embedded into the actual immersive work. Each work that we do is carefully crafted using haptics, using spatial sound design, using AI. All of these elements all play a huge part in the delivery of the immersive experiences. So it's important to recognize that, it, again, it comes back to the creative vision then you are able to really start building something that has value and has substance that will hold itself well in the immersive experiences with the narrative structures. So through our own research, we also realized that there were different ways of engaging our audiences. For example, we've built actually custom seats there were, called, there were pebbles, actually, they looked like pebbles, stones, but inside were embedded deep, um, deep bass speakers. So that when there was a point in the show where we was hearing and feeling the sound of the loggers taking away all the trees in the Amazonian forest. And those rumbles were not just coming from the speakers that were surround sound 360 degrees. They were coming from the floor and they're also coming from the pebble speakers. So the seats that the children were sat on, they were able to roll in it, they were able to lie down in it, and they, used to, they could feel it. And that, to create that visceral experience is really important for these particular audiences that we work for. So a lot of this talk is about levelling up and about how we're reaching different audiences. And where we're based, we're based in the northwest of England, where 20.3% of the population, um, according to the census, um, are of disabled or additional needs. That's apparently the second highest in England. There is a huge demand, there is a huge need to serve these audiences and they need to get access to high quality experiences and digital technology is the way forward to allow that opportunity the, these audiences are shielding and they're currently shielding and through conversations we have learned that they've never had the chance to experience a theatre production or they never had a chance to visit a music, uh, music show or a gig because of their particular needs and that shouldn't be a barrier. You know, we should try and remove those barriers and, and I think this is one way that is allowing an opportunity for them to access uh, what they so rightly deserve. So I, I do believe that this is a different perspective, a different way of actually in, integrating digital technology using 5G, haptics, AI. There's so many different elements that we can really carefully um, build in, choreograph and design with um, and make sure that we are delivering high quality theatre to those that really need it in our country and, and beyond as well. And I, I do believe that there is a, there's a real need to, to serve audiences with additional needs. And, and I think it's, it's finally coming through. So thank you so much for listening and I'll now pass you over. Thank you very much, Debbie. I think it's my turn and it's really wonderful to know more about the work that you have been doing. Um, so hi everyone, my name is um, Dana. I prepared a few slides. Thanks to the Creative Industries uh, Research Network for inviting me. It's um, great to be here and I'm very excited to talk about my research, which explores 
the use of immersive technologies in community-based settings. I'm interested in the question of how we can maximize the potential of um, these technologies for community engagement. So um, today I will talk about my current um, research project, which is ongoing, and the title is uh, Venus Pindi. So you may be wondering what is the meaning behind the title. I will explain that in a moment. So the research is uh, practice space and um, aims to critically interrogate the extent to which 360 degree documentary could uh, generate more empathy um, with documentary subjects. Um, the first phase of this research entailed the production of a 360 degree demo uh, focusing on two uh, Greek drug artists who live in Athens. Uh, the demo is less than three minutes long and um, explores their performance art as a form of resistance by capturing one of their drug performances and an interview with the participants. So in terms of the title, um, it refers to a performance that participants were developing at the time of filming, and um, this inspired the performance that they staged uh, for the demo. And the title particularly refers to the artist's fascination with the divine. So you may be aware that Venus was the Roman goddess of love and the incorporation of aspects of Greek folklore into their work. Pindus is the name of a mountainous area in Greece. And just to give you a flavor of the performance, um, this is a two dimensional image, which is a screenshot from the 360 degree demo. Uh, filming took place in an independent art space in Athens, and you can see one of the participants performing in the center of the image, and the other one is in the left side. I hope you can see them. Um, and in case you're not familiar with a 360 degree video, users can turn their head in any direction, but they are in a fixed position within the scene. So, for this project, the idea was that users could experience this performance as if they were immersed in the art space, situated in the center of the room where the camera was uh, positioned. And the participants were performing around the camera. Um, in terms of viewing, 360 degree video can be viewed wearing VR headsets or on desktop computers um, by using the mouse to pan and uh, look around. As I mentioned before, the research set out to explore the empathic potential of um, 360 degree documentary. So what is empathy? Empathy refers to an ability that encompasses diverse psychological processes related to sharing the internal mental states of others. And literature in this area differentiates between two types of empathy. So we have emotional empathy, which is a mirrored somatic response um, to someone else's internal emotional state. But I'm mainly interested in cognitive empathy, which entails an understanding of the similarities between observers and artifacts. And this may result in a process of perspective taking with the artist. It has to do with the act of understanding a creator through their work, which may in turn result in their empathizing with the subjects. Empathy in VR documentary more specifically has been associated with the perspectives of uh, VR designers. And in this project, I was interested in developing a better understanding of the participants uh, through the creation of this demo. The community of drug artists in Greece is underrepresented and there are no other 360 degree documentaries on this topic. So I was keen to explore the potential of this technology to provide insights into their artistic practices and also the challenges they may face. The second phase of uh, the project will investigate if cognitive empathy can be developed using data collected in a series of focus groups with audiences experiencing the demo. And the discussions will aim to explore the extent to which audiences can understand my choices and decisions in the creative process. 
uh, by engaging with the demo. Finally, the empathic potential of VR has been related to ethical considerations. And there we go. Um, on the basis that VR documentary makers should do justice to those they represent in their experiences if claims of empathy are to be legitimate. So in the final part of this presentation, I will talk about some of the ethical and creative challenges that emerged uh, from the research so far. The first challenge was that from the outset, I was aware of my position as an outsider to the community of drug artists that participants are part of. The project was driven by my respect for participants' commitment to their arts, despite the pressures of the current social and political situation in Greece, where I also um, come from. So I started the project as a way to express my solidarity with participants, and I consider them to be fellow artists. Throughout the pre-production process, I maintained communication with participants and I tried to follow the principles of ethical um, documentary practice, including uh, building trust and showing respect. However, this process did not result in an organic filming process, as it quickly became evident that one of the participants was not comfortable when the camera was recording. And um, this is a screenshot from the interview scene. Um, so I tried to um, help the participants to relax um, by having breaks, but the tension continued as soon as um, the camera was on. Ultimately, I was not able to engage participants in the in-depth interview that I was hoping to capture. Um, and I could not overcome the barriers of communication that derived from my position as an outsider to their community. Another challenge that came up in the stage of post-production had to do with creatively incorporating English subtitles into the 360 degree environment as the interview was conducted in Greek. Uh, the importance of audio cues in uh, VR storytelling as a way to direct the attention of the audience and enhance a sense of presence um, has been discussed extensively given the richness of a 360 degree environment long subtitles could compete for the attention of non-greek speaking audiences and potentially result in reduced engagement with other elements in the scene um, here you can see how my solution looks like so i decided to introduce subtitles in the scene following the opening drug performance where the only visual reference is this static image of one of the participants against a black background. Um, this seemed to be okay, it did not uh, significantly disrupt the storytelling. However, it made me question how sustainable this approach to subtitles could be in a longer VR piece um, using voiceover. Finally, when the demo was completed, um, I shared it with participants in order to get their feedback and also get their con consent to use it in the second phase um, of the project. And part participants provided their consent, but they felt that the slower pace of the demo and 360 degree storytelling in general did not really convey the vitality um, and the vibrance of their performances. Um, and also um, they thought that um, because the live audience element uh, was missing, the essence um, of their art was not conveyed um, through that piece. So due to the constraints of the medium and the overall implications of remote collaboration, they decided to um, uh, not continue taking part in the uh, research, exercising their right to withdraw. I was hoping to develop a longer documentary with them, but um, this is not possible anymore. So to conclude, the first phase of this project pointed to some of the limits of 360 degree video to generate empathy uh, with documentary subjects, including um, gaining the perspectives of participants using subtitles and providing a meaningful way to capture underrepresented artistic practices. The next phase of the project um, will um, entail collecting feedback from audiences, as I mentioned, in um, 
focus groups to explore their responses to the demo with an emphasis on cognitive empathy. Uh, and hopefully this will contribute to further findings regarding the empathic potential of 360 degree documentary. Thank you very much for listening and um, I look forward to um, the questions. Good, brilliant. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um... Okay, so my name is Tobias Palma. Uh, I'm very thankful for the invitation to be here. Um, this is very exciting to be sharing uh, th this panel with Debbie and Anai uh, and how we are working with all with immersive media, but from different approaches, which I think is really, really exciting. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of my work. Uh, this is a, rather, a little bit of a long presentation, so if I am taking too long, just please let me know and I'll rush it up. So um, I'm, I, I work mostly with virtual reality, uh, almost exclusively with virtual reality and immersive media and also interactivity. And I've been, I'm, I, I'm a little bit of a, in a transition from the, my research, where, which where, what I did during my PhD and what I'm doing now, which has a lot to do with empathy, uh, which, which is kind of very fortunate that Dana is also working with the same concept, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, so yeah. Um, Something happened here. Okay, so I work with this. Uh, I've been working with the concept of post spectatorship. So, what is this? Uh, post spectatorship is, is a concept that I, I've been trying to use to in order to understand how the conditions of uh, the expectator of virtual reality and immersive media and interactive media has changed and how this subject, we, that we, when we consume this kind of media, is, is different from going to the cinema or watching the telly or going to the theater regularly so, so how this changes uh, the post spectator concept is borrowed from uh, post humanism and transhumanism but in a much more much more much less dramatic way um, it doesn't have to anything to do with becoming cyborgs but more with how do we incorporate technology uh, how do we re rely on technology to consume this media? Um, the post spectator relies heavily on a prosthetic device. Uh, prosthetic device is it could be a, a basic. We are basically now in this moment we are having a prosthetic uh, meeting uh, because we rely on technology to have it. There's no other, we couldn't have this meeting if we didn't have technology. So that that's the kind of thing. It doesn't have to be invasive. But it's heavily it heavily relies on technology, uh, and the whole idea of this how this process, the, the process is it becomes a, a tool of social and historical status. It's it's it, it's not necessarily defined by the physical properties, but by by, by the use we make of it. Um, um, and this it, it would. Uh, basically we would be redefining our condition as media consumers. Uh, the notion of homo digitalis, so again, it's not as traumatic as it sounds, but it's a theoretical concept that has to do with the evolution of the way we consume media. It's, it's uh, this evolution has to do with previous concepts that have been used before, the, 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 with Marshall McLuhan, uh, uh, one of the greatest media scholars in history from the 60s, he coined the homo electronicus uh, uh, concept of how ele electronic media was producing heavy changes in that uh, at the time. Then uh, of the homo readings by Gio Italian scholar Giovanni Sartori, which has to do with, with basically relying on television. And no nowadays, it's basically the same, all the same process has is seen new changes and new conditions thanks to digital media. Um, and of course it has to do with relying on digital stuff like it, it, the internet of things, uh, a lot of mobile phones and smart uh, uh, smartphones had to do with a lot of that. We all rely a lot on those, so that kind of thing. And of course virtual reality has, it, it has a lot to do with it. So. Um, this leads to basically how through this kind of media we I, I can become um, emancipated spectators, which is again a concept borrowed 
from actually theater, uh, how the, the emancipated spectator by uh, Jack Rancière, a French scholar, uh, so, uh, he developed this concept from immersive theater. Uh, um, but I basically took it and brought it to um, immersive media. Um, it has to do with how this, uh, the ability to interact with the storytelling and the immersive, uh, the immersive storytelling devices has given us the ability to emancipate from the just the passive role of spectating, which comes from well, the, the, the ability to contemplate, just to contemplate. The thing is, as with reality, immersive media, interactive media, and interactive storytelling, we don't just contemplate anymore. Actually, it is not possible. The whole concept about this kind of this kind of storytelling is that we can't make the story progress, we can't really tell the story unless we interact with it, unless we have some kind of agency with it. And so if we don't interact with it, there's no story. And that's and that's a, quite a revolutionary thing in terms of storytelling. Um, so it, and, and it's a quite some symbiotic relationship between the story and the spectator. Um, and of course, that makes uh, uh, this and it ha also has to do with the notion of uh, uh, of processes, about that basically our bodies become a device in themselves. There's a certain level of uh, how, uh, unless we, we use the body as triggers, so then we we with the, we have to find some ways of how to to exercise our, our agency, and that happens basically through our body. Um, so while we gain agency, of course, the, the body becomes a device. Um, and be, and like, like I said before, without interaction, there's no story, which basically means that without our bodies, there's no story, story either. Um, in virtual reality, this is quite uh, significant because we can or not exist in the virtual environment, which it depends a lot on the kind of uh, uh, the, the film or video game or whatever we're experiencing. Sometimes we are disembodied, we don't exist, they would just kind of want to view, or sometimes we are asked to actually play a character or to or, or, or to be seated in a place in, in, in like in a virtual theater or virtual venue. Or, so that can suppose different reactions of how we actually experiencing ourselves in these virtual uh, places. So um but yeah, that's a whole discussion. It's a very, very groundbreaking uh, discussion, um, and it's very uh, inconclusive at this point. But yeah, it's I'm I, I live for it. I really like it. Um, and then uh, we're jumping to what I'm doing now, which has to do with how do we generate empathy in using virtuality. There is the, the, uh, uh, several years ago, uh, Chris Merck uh, in 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 a rather famous or unfamous, depending on who you ask, uh, TED Talk, Chris Milk, uh, dared to say that virtual reality is the ultimate empathy machine. And this just, that, that, that little phrase has uh, allowed us to be discussing uh, around it for eight, almost eight years now. Um, because, and there's been a lot of discussion from that point. Uh, but the thing is, how if this is true, and if this is true, and then how do we use it to exploit the the this, the ability of that virtuality has to uh, embody someone else or to be ourselves uh, to uh, uh, have a, a sort of body like experience in a different environment. Um, yeah, a lot of se several questions, which probably Denai has been working uh, on, and for the last few years. So, uh, for instance, uh, the virtual reality clouds over Sidra, uh, which is rather famous, kind uh, of groundbreaking uh, documentary in the field. Uh, in this documentary, viewers are immersed into the Saatari refugee camp in Jordan. And basically, they are allowed to have an experience of this very particular, very well-defined context. Uh, and this documentary was uh, produced for UNICEF in order to basically get people to get more engaged with this kind of reality. Uh, uh, what is very significant to me in this is, is how virtual reality had instead of basically virtual reality kind of uh, started as a, with this idea of 
allowing us to get into more fantasy worlds, like to escape in from reality. But what the virtual reality and empathy are, are, are producing, and what one of the abilities of virtual reality and video, video virtual reality, uh, is that basically it's, it's have, it, what is allowing us is basically quite the opposite, is to engage with our world in a different way, not escaping from it, but actually getting to getting to access it from different from different ways. Um, a little bit what Danai just said uh, is uh, empathy and presence are strongly related. Presence, for those of you who don't know, is the feeling of being in a particular place, which virtuality has a lot to do because it, it, it's supposed to give us the feeling that we are in a different place from the, the place that we are actually in, uh, which has everything to do with uh, the ability of virtuality to, to transport us into, for instance, a refugee camp in Jordan. Um, there are ways to measure uh, empathy, which are probably different. I'm not going to go very deep into this because I might get into a conflict with the night, but still, um, and that ways to measure how do we get actually to produce empathy or generate empathy through virtual reality. The, the what is important uh, in here is it has to do with that thing, the ability that virtual reality has to, to generate the feeling of presence, of being somewhere else, of being with other people in some other place of the world in a different circumstances and how can from that uh, we can actually empathize with those particular circumstances um, and this leads finally just to finish this leads me to what i'm doing now which is basically since we have virtual reality since we have the ability to generate empathy is how do we get to use these tools to for fundraising purposes, uh, and not on, this doesn't only mean to. I mean, it, ideally, it means to get people to donate and make uh, uh, economic collaborations with the different causes. But it has to do with participation, not only economic participation, but basically with any kind of participation. How do we get people to participate with different causes uh, from uh, try from and use the virtual reality for those purposes? Uh, I just got mail, sorry for that noise. Um, so the hypothesis is that virtual reality has the potential to increase feelings of presence and henceforth of empathy towards circumstances and ex events external to our daily circumstances. Like I said, uh, this has to do with, I think, uh, this is a very interesting direction that virtual reality is taking, is that it has, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to do with evading or escaping from our the real world, but actually, us becoming a tool to approach it, to 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 get to those parts of the world that are not uh, as commonly accessible from our daily lives. Um, so yeah, that's me. Uh, thank you very much. I hopefully I wasn't too rushed up. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you to all three of you. Sorry, let me just uh, spotlight myself again. Yes, brilliant. Oh my God, I have so many questions. <laughs> I don't think we'll have time to cover all of my questions, but I will start with your audience questions first because they always take priority. So um, we'll do uh, one question each and then um, we'll keep going. The, the first one comes from um, Philippa and it's to Debbie. Um, and I think Debbie, you touched on this a little bit, but if you can explain a little bit more about where the story comes from and was it made in collaboration with indigenous Amazonian peoples and how does it progress and so on and so forth. Okay, so this, this the narrative in the story um, was um, a research that I've been doing in terms of studying the Awa tribe in the Amazonian forest, um, understanding um, how they they live in the in the environment and how they are um, connected to to that environment. Um, in in effect, how they probably have so much knowledge that we're not even aware of because they are living, breathing in that that world. So with, with that level of research that I accumulated for, for potentially over six months, um, that allowed me to sit and write and create a script 
um, which consisted of vocals and lyrics, um, as well as the, the immersive experiences that I wanted the audiences to engage with. But yes, it all stems from that kind of research element and the depth of understanding the characters and the, the essence of what they're trying to convey through the use of their words, through their movement, um, and even through the, the textures that we use in the set. So we use living walls, we brought plants, we even use the smell of um, the rain that came through, through, um, through the different diffusers in the room as well, so that they could get a sense of, of the earth as they touched the, the uh, gravel on the floor as well. So it's, there's a lot of different layers, but yes, it all stems from that understanding of the tribe. Um, I wish I could have the opportunity to travel there, to be honest, um, maybe one day. Um, but yeah, that's hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Um, and then a question for Danai from, from Larissa. Um, Danai, can you tell us a little bit more about the structure um, or other creative design of the piece? What specific techniques did you use to generate cognitive empathy beyond immersion in the artistic space? And I think that sort of touches on what Tobias was last talking about, the presence and the immersiveness and so on. Sure, so this was only a demo, a very short piece, and um, I was also working with a new technology, so 360 degree technology is fairly new, generally speaking, it was new for me as a practitioner and was also new um, for the participants, so the aim of that first pilot phase was to explore what we can do um, with this um, technology, and for the demo, um, the plan was to capture the performance, so that's the opening scene, and the interview. So I think to answer the question, what happens beyond immersion in the artistic space, I would say it would be the, the interview scene. And again, I, I had high hopes. I was really hoping to engage participants in an in-depth discussion about their challenges, about their art, what it means to them, their inspirations, um, what, what is it that uh, pushes them to go on and on and be committed to their art despite all the uh, the pressures of um, the, the 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 society in Greece basically um, and it just turned out to be harder than I thought even though in previous meetings even in face-to-face -face meetings that we had before the camera started filming it was easier and we had some really interesting and wonderful conversations when it was time for the camera to record we just lost that magic and i could only find out what was going on when we were there filming it was not possible to um, verify that in earlier stages um, and in terms of empathy I think sound is very important um, here. The sound design, for me, it was also very important to um, maintain the language. So it's really interesting that Tobias used the example of clouds over cedra. So for people who haven't watched that documentary, there is an English voiceover. Um, and you can hear, I think, the, the Syrian uh, voiceover at the same time. but. To me, as a documentary maker, this is not particularly ethical. So I really wanted to have the voice of the participants in the demo that meant using English subtitles. And it was a real challenge to find the right balance between using the subtitles in a way that is not very disruptive in the 360 and VR environment, because there are so many things going on. So when I tried to build that empathy through sound, it didn't work for me. And I think, the fact that I was not able to develop that connection with them when the camera was on was another limitation. So I think it didn't go very well on many levels and technology was one of them. Um, and I think it taught me that even though there is a lot of potential in immersive technology and there is definitely a promise and this is my starting point, I'm fascinated by what this technology can do. Sometimes in practice, it's just more challenging, I suppose. So it's really interesting to find ways um, to go around that, to go about that and to materialize that potential, I guess. 
I yeah, and I I think someone mentioned in the chat how interesting it is that you're honestly reflecting on your experience, and I loved your um, you're referring to the artists and the documentary who talked about the essence of their art. Now I assume whether the essence of art is going to change as technology progresses even further as you know art has been changing together with technology and, and they've been influencing each other so you know I think this has still been a very very useful experiment and I'm, I'm sure you agree and I um, but another question for uh, Tobias this time uh, again from Larissa I'm curious because Milk's idea of an empathy machine would seem to rob the spectator of their agency by manipulating them emotionally. Do you see the configuration of empathy at odds with the politic post-spectatorship? Does the participant have the right to know they're entering an experience that challenges their empathy? Um, well, thanks, Larissa, for your question. I think I, I love it. It's, it's so complicated <laughs> and challenging, but... Oh, I know. Say it's a question that it, I think uh, it can be approached. I mean, there has there are so many different topics in this question, but I, uh, but I think on the one hand, uh, the 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 whole politics of post spectatorship had to do with 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 co creation and co authoring. So the the the, the idea of the, one of the main differences of having this agency is that the 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 author of the piece is kind of. Um, abandoning it's it's already kind of giving you the piece so you can actually do pretty much whatever the way whatever you want to do with it and and and, and you are the basically even in virtualities which is you have a, an immersive environment a 360 environment you get to choose what you want to look at it because simply because looking at all of it at the same time is just impossible and that kind of allows you to have different experiences every time you watch it um so that's a, and that that has to do with co-creating um and the I think also we have to keep in mind that the the empathy it's it, it's not a new thing it's a, it's kind of been enhanced or um, um, it's but it, it, it's it's more uh, probably more evident in immersive media but the whole purpose of documentaries and actually of storytelling is to generate some kind of empathy or sympathy with your characters if you if you don't empathize with the characters of whatever you you're reading or watching you probably won't like the film the novel the whatever you um that being said uh i the, if the, the last question is, is, is do, do, does the participant have the right to know their entire experience that challenges empathy of course they do uh if you don't tell them uh, you are basically misleading them and that's unethical uh, and that has to do also with the it's not in virtuality we don't really abandon completely our sense of who we are or where we are this 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 embodiment disembodiment experience but we don't really uh forget what where we are and and of course you you basically you're, you're allowed to you should always be allowed to take, take the headset off where uh, if you don't like it, if you don't, if you're bored, if you feel dizzy, if you get uh, sick, whatever, if you, whatever kind of unpleasantness, you just take it off. It's if you're not used to virtuality, it can be quite dizzying. Uh, it's it, it it can produce a very very uh, unpleasant uh, feeling. So you sh you should just be able to take it off. Um, but um, also that being said, I think you since you never forget. You, you you don't really you're always aware of who you are you that 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 relationship that co-creation is probably one of the most exciting things about post spectatorship is that you, you get to participate but you also get to put yourself uh, put part of yourself into the story and the, the way that you're in the way that you how you're going to read that uh that story so. thank you tobias um and now back to debbie um, I'd like to combine the two questions by uh, Philippa and John because they relate to the setup and the actual technical aspects of it. So Philippa's asking about how do you replicate the technical setup with the soundscapes in multiple venues? Is it simultaneously performed? Um, and John is asking about you know the user end of the setup. So is this experienced from home? Do you send uh, people the equipment? So can you talk us through this? 
Uh, so the technical side of things. So in terms of the soundscapes um, and the sound scores, the the um, the haptic um, interactions as well. That's all done through a platform, our platform, which is then sent remotely to the different venues. So whether that was a home or a special school or a hospice or a library or a theatre, um, you know, the idea is that we can connect. Um, remotely using at the moment it's 5G band we're going to go into a different um, level soon but it's using that sort of uh, low latency so that's allowing you to get as close to real time as possible interactivity um, so there isn't a lag um, there were times that there was a lag because where we are located um, you know 5G is not, it's not necessarily hit these shores. Um, so in terms of what we were doing, we had to kind of accommodate that. So a lot of the, there was a lot of skill that was needed to allow time and space to let uh, the words uh, dissipate as we were able to interact with the children and then with our audiences. But for, for the user end, you have to, when you are just answering that last section where you, if you are going to a different sort of home, sending the equipment, you have to ensure that there is an onboarding um, process. So that's a lot of the sort of pre-work that we've also done is sending out um, lots of information with the actual, who the characters are going to be uh, for the social stories element for our audiences, um, as well as the technical side as well, so that they are totally uh, feel equipped, confident, and know that they're in safe hands. That when we do deliver the ex immersive experiences, that it will happen. And it does, you know, there were luckily there weren't any glitches, but like technology, as we all know, it, it um, there are some some silly, um, you know, demons that live there, but we can always eradicate them um, if you know how to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we have questions from Augustus and Mitchell. I keep trying to combine things because I am very aware of time. Um, but basically, uh, there are two deny and Tobias. And the topic is um, the underrepresented communities and their view about VR or 360 video as a, as a mediation structure. And then Mitchell sort of expands on this a little bit, um, asking about what purpose you think empathy serves in attempting to better the situation of underrepresented or underprivileged communities that you're trying to represent. Is VR truly achieving this? Um, and could it also, um, could a focus on empathy allow structural violence to perpetuate by taking the focus away from showing the effects of uneven power structures, et cetera? So basically, is it just um, a, a sort of um, taking the, the, the attention away, sort of like a, a, a sort of technological trick, if you must, um, to not really properly address the societal injustices? Um, so, Denai and Tobias, would you like to sort of address this um, in a way? So, I can have a go at answering this and um, I can definitely um, share the opinions of my participants. Um, and they were not particularly interested, I think, in um, VR as the empathy machine. Also, it took me a while to understand that I maybe they were not interested in um, other people empathizing with them in general. So the whole purpose maybe of the project didn't seem to be very um, um, aligned with what they wanted as, as a community. I think they were fascinated at first and very excited by this new technology. And when I also started talking to them about what is 360 degree video and how it looks like and what we could do. And it was definitely, I think, creatively for them, something interesting, but they were just not very um, excited with the demo when I shared it with them with the final piece. So they just didn't really believe that this was something interesting and good for them. So in that sense, yeah, it didn't really work. Um, and I, I think there is a promise, as I said, to use these technologies to better understand other people and other groups, but we're still figuring out the best way to do that. So yeah, I don't think it is the ultimate empathy machine as it has been uh, labeled previously, but there, there is a lot of work to be done around that. And that is very exciting. So over to you, 
um, Tobias. Yeah, I agree with with with, with most, if not everything that you that, that you said. It's uh, I think the, the that statement. It's a uh, the virtual reality is the ultimate um, empathy machine. It's uh, a little bit exaggerated. Uh, um, mostly because, on, on the, if from a more academic point of view, the, the, all the, 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 the conclusions are so far are highly inconclusive. Uh, this is the things that we are still trying to develop on a number of fields. So on the one hand, like, like Dan, Dan I clearly has, has experienced and I has, have experienced myself, is we, we are still figuring out how to use virtual reality just to tell stories, how, what, what are the grammars, what are the, the language, because it's clearly not the same as filmmaking. It has different rules, it's different settings. So in, as, an, as an expressive tool, it's still, it's still new. I mean, the, 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 the technology is great, but how do we use technology is a completely different thing. And from there to how do we use this thing that we really don't know how to use to create something like the, to generate empathy, that's a different level. So there are still a number of challenges. And how, for instance, how do we use subtitles? The subtitles is kind of like a very important thing if you want to communicate in different languages. How do we use sound, which is sent fascinating field of, of, of how do you use immersiveness in general. So uh, I'd say that there is I, there is potential, that, that which is why we are working with this kind of thing. We kind of feel that there is something to do that it could be used, but this, everything is very, very, very still inconclusive. I would say, however, that um, in terms of fundraising purposes, there are a, a number of um, nonprofits, like very big nonprofits, like UNICEF, which I mentioned, uh, pr uh, produced uh, Clouds of Sidra. They also produce uh, Welcome to Aleppo. And the, there's uh, another short film called The Party, which was produ produced by The Guardian. It has to do with uh, uh, autism. Um, Oxfam, uh, the Red International Red Cross. There's a number of very big nonprofits that are actually using virtuality, and they've had positive uh, effects on the, on fundraising purposes, which is good. But on the other hand, they they, they haven't been like life changing. It's not like the virtuality has changed the way in which we get donations. Um, it's been positive, but it's not hasn't been just as groundbreaking as one would wish uh, so yeah this is a very underwhelming <laughs> uh, answer but it's the it's it's the reality it is uh, i we still don't know because we're still working on it and not just me and, and nice it's this whole field of researchers and practitioners now we're still trying to figure out figure virtuality out so yeah mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I have a bunch more questions and I know there's at least one more question in the chat. Um, so I was wondering whether you would mind putting um, any email or social media handles that you um, want to share with people in the chat. If they want to follow up on this conversation and get in touch with you, how do they, or you know, a website, a LinkedIn, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat for people uh, to follow up on this conversation because well, I know I definitely have a lot more questions about empathy and the philosophical side of it. And yeah, it's been very, very illuminating, very exciting. Thank you so much for this panel. Time has flown by. Um, thank you again for coming uh, to our guests. So thank you so much for coming. And thank you to our lovely presenters today.